begin by reading from Philippians chapter 4, just verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. I love the last chapter of Philippians. In fact, the whole book is, or letter, is pretty fantastic. This was one of the first churches that Paul established when he transitioned out of Asia Minor and went into actually into Greece. And it's a church that has been faithful in supporting him over the years of his ministry that he has connected with time and again. And he writes to them just to encourage them. It's not like 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians where he had to kind of lay the hammer down. No, in Philippians it's just like, Keep going. You got this. Trust him. Humble yourselves. Remember who God is, and that will get you through. I feel like that message is so necessary and relevant to us, especially in times of great anxiety, like here and today. See, the thing I've been noticing about anxiety is it's all about the future. It's all about problem solving, all about figuring out what could happen and not letting it hurt. At least imagining that we have that kind of control, right? In the movie Inside Out 2, what I love about that film is anxiety hijacks the imagination of the little girl Riley and forces them all into little cubicles where they all have to come up with the absolute worst things that could possibly happen to Riley so they can plan to prevent them. And I think about that image of hijacking our creativity, hijacking our imagination, and using it to torture us. Exploiting that gift of God that is in us, that imago Dei that is creative and generative and powerful, that can spin worlds into being, and using it just to get us to be more and more and more afraid, to get us to be smaller and smaller. And that is the thing that we are called to interrupt. How? How will we interrupt? Because anxiety is not interested in meeting the present moment with trust. Anxiety is not interested in meeting the present moment with gratitude. And these are the two things that will help us most, that will help root us and ground us, that will allow us to endure those destroying storms that the psalmist talks about. See, a mind that is rooted in God is able to spread its branches. A mind that is rooted in God is able to spread its branches. We all know that the world is about as big as our ability to perceive it at any given time. Now there's a good example of this. Uh, the world was the Mediterranean at the time of Jesus. Why was it the Mediterranean? Because that was the area that Rome controlled. And what that meant was that information could travel throughout the Mediterranean. See, one of the things that Rome was great at was roads. Roads and aqueducts. And what that meant was it meant access. It meant people could be connected to each other all over the world. And so information and the idea of the world was much bigger at the time of Jesus than it had been before because there wasn't that kind of connection, that kind of infrastructure. Think about the world that you live in now and how big the world is. Interestingly, though, uh, I was in Kosovo in 20... When was that? 20, 2008. 2008. It was... Four months before they voted for independence. See, at the time, they were part of Serbia, and they had had a UN delegation there for over a decade preventing ethnic cleansing and violence happening in uh, Kosovo. Kosovo was predominantly ethnic Albanian, but was part of Serbia and was still part of Serbia after Yugoslavia came apart. I could talk about that stuff forever, but I'll, I'll, I won't bore you with that. But anyway, I was in Kosovo doing a class on global and inclusive teaching. At the time, I was intending to become a genocide scholar and teach and create curriculum for kids to learn about mass violence. You know, really light topics. Because <laughs> I wanted kids to know more about that, apparently. Um, 
And she had us do an exercise. And in the exercise, what she did was she gave us these huge pieces of chart paper and split us up into small groups. And about half the class was ethnic Albanians uh, from Kosovo, and the other half was international students who were all there together. And she said, I want you to draw a map of the world and start close in and then expand. And the one pattern I noticed when we shared these eventually was how well drawn the map of Kosovo was. It was intricate. It is not a clean little country like Nebraska, right? Like it had lots of little pockets, lots of geography that it traces. And every one of the maps had a beautifully articulated picture that was pretty darn accurate of what Kosovo looked like. And then outside of that, roughly good drawings of the countries that abutted Kosovo. And then beyond that, I mean, it was a hot mess. Like, really had no idea even two countries over. And I thought how accurate that is for a country that's striving so much for independence that has felt decades of oppression by a violent country, has seen their neighbors literally go through genocide. And that internal focus, that anxiousness, the world was that big. And I think about the relative peace that I have lived in my whole life that allowed me to have a concept of a bigger world. Now, if you told me to draw the Washington state and then add all the states around it and do the whole United States, I probably wouldn't do that great a job of that either, okay? I'm gonna admit it's a little bit of judgment on my part, but I just noticed how much the world is the size of our ability to perceive it. Now last week I had the gift of being able to lead a bystander intervention workshop and I've been doing that since, well, since the election in 2016 when we were all going through the same amount of anxiety and fear. This congregation actually asked me to develop this workshop to help us figure out how do we intervene when we hear hate speech and harassment. And I did a lot of research and I did a lot of work trying to figure out what do I want people to know and be able to do when someone is acting a fool and someone else is feeling threatened. And every time I do this workshop, I tell people, I am not going to tell you what to do. I'm not going to give you pointers. You're not going to walk away with a list of things to do because I'm not you. I don't know what it is to live in your body, in your mind, with your experiences and your memories and your traumas. Who am I to tell you how to intervene? Also, every situation you're going to meet out there in the world is going to be different. It's going to be distinct. The nuances, the dynamics, the gender and the age and the race, the histories are all going to be different every time. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to learn about who we are. And I spent three hours with people where I helped them come to understand their own experience of stress, anxiety, what happens in their bodies, where do they feel it first, start to notice. And I stress them out. I tell them, you're going to be safe in this workshop, but if we do it right, you're going to be deeply uncomfortable at least half of the time. Because that's how you're going to know. Just like faith, we don't know what we trust in when it's easy. We know what we trust in when it's difficult. And so I stress people out. And I get them to stress each other out. And I get them to engage in a way to start noticing what's going on. Why? Because I tell them, you know what happens is that your brain gets hijacked by your fear, your anxiety, your stress, your worry, your anger. It literally moves blood around in your brain. I could talk about this forever, but I just want to tell you that stress hormones move blood away from the front of your brain and to the back of your brain. And there's two really critical things that happen in the front of your brain. Number one is you do complex reasoning critical thinking, your analysis, your understanding of all the moving parts, your integration, big picture thinking, all that happens up here. The other thing that happens up here is very connected but very different. It's your ability to have empathy, your ability to connect emotionally, your ability to perceive, understand, and feel with someone. And so I say when you get stressed out, when you get 
fearful, anxious, angry, you get dumber and meaner at the same time. And don't we know that's the truth? Don't we absolutely look around and know, man, dumb and meaner, that's about right. And so my teaching is very simple. It says, look, if you want to be helpful, if you want to be part of the solution in the world, what you need to do is figure out how to be kinder and smarter, and then figure out how to invite other people to be kinder and smarter too. Co-regulation. I heard you say that earlier, right? How do we get to know ourselves, know our triggers, know what stresses us out, know what it feels like? How many of you have been stressed out and you had no idea? You just didn't know until you knew, and then you're like, oh, wow, there's my shoulders. Ooh, right? All of a sudden, you're needing to go get massages twice a week, and you have no idea why. You're going to see the chiropractor all the time. Something's not right. You know, if you're out of alignment, your walk is crooked. The other thing we know about being stressed out, being angry, being anxious, is it gives us a myopic focus. We can only see so much. We can only perceive so much of the world. So many of those Kosovar Albanians had a myopic focus because they were born into a traumatic situation. They had never had low levels of cortisol in their whole lives. They were always aware that at any moment, violence could break out on their border. And that if the UN peacekeepers left, it's a matter of days. So many places in our world are like that. And sometimes our brain thinks that's the world that we live in, too. Now, some of us do live in violent and terrifying situations. Some of us have grown up in places of lack of access to resources, lack of access to love and care. And our brains have been formed within a stressful environment that deeply impacted us. And we have to work every day against the way that we were formed because of neglect, because of abuse. But many of us don't. But you know what the thing is? Is your brain has no idea what you're actually facing out there in the world. It only knows what it's trying to do. And what's the number one, the only job your brain has? Survival. It wants to keep you alive. That is its primary job. It's really, honestly, its only job. But the problem is, is that sometimes we think we're going to die from stuff that ain't going to kill us. Say that with me. We think we're going to die from stuff that ain't going to kill us. Right? Now, the psalmist says this. Their teeth are like spears and arrows. Their tongues sharp swords. Remember we talked about, when we were talking about hell, we talked about gnashing of teeth. Gnashing of teeth is a display of anger. It's not this uh, experience of suffering that we often think of when we think of weeping and gnashing of teeth, it's a display of anger. It's like baring your teeth like a dog, right? How many times have we had the experience of somebody being angry at us and we definitely thought the world was about to be over? How many times has somebody's words felt like they could cut us up to pieces, that we could lose everything because of somebody running their mouth? Our system got hijacked, and all of a sudden, all we could see was the thing in front of us, and it was life or death. It's at that moment that we need to root and ground in God. And in my workshops, we always, at first, I invite them to go in their mind to a perfectly peaceful place and inhabit it in their body. Feel it on their skin. Hear it in their ears. And then give it a word. One word. And that becomes a tool for them. Because then when they get stressed, angry, anxious, fearful, they're in the moment. Can they recall that one word? And what happens, amazingly, you'd think this wouldn't work. You'd think that your brain was smarter than this, but it's not. You recall, you imagine, and your cortisol levels drop. Dopamine, endorphins are released into your system, and you can get access to the front of your brain again. You can manipulate your own brain by choosing what to think about. It seems like it shouldn't work, but I promise you that it does. And those stories you told earlier are part of your defense system against anxiety, against becoming out of control, against becoming deregulated, coming back to those salvation stories. Because a mind that is rooted in God can branch out. 
Now the psalmist, at the second half, starts singing. Starts singing the praises of God. The psalmist is going to wake up the dawn. I mean, hyperbole, sure. Arrogance, maybe. But what I love about it is this sense of, like, I'm going to sing anyway. Now, what's interesting about that is that we know that singing has a profound effect on your brain. We know that it can help you uh, do more cognitive processing. It can help you connect both sides of your brain. But we also know that singing does something amazing to your body brain as well. When you sing together, you breathe together because you kind of have to, right? If you're going to make sound at the same time, you need to be releasing air at the same time, which means you need to gulp down air as quick as you can between the things. Choir directors in the room, so I know that's not exactly how it works. I appreciate all of you. But there's also research that says that heartbeats align when we sing together. There's also research that says our brain waves align when we sing together. That like the mycelium in the ground, we become one people. How many of you have ever sung in a choir and you had that moment of transcendence? where you were part of something, it just, you just felt it, you couldn't name it, whatever it was, but, ooh, right? That vibe, that energy, it changes us. Now, I just got to note how sad it is that our culture is so disconnected from communal singing. Where else other than church, unless you're in a choir that's not in church, where else do you sing together? Where else? Football games, Christmas, campfire, preschool, the national anthem praising him, the enforced communal utterance. Yeah. But not that long ago, a few generations ago, our ancestors sang together all the time. They would sing when they would work. They would sing when they would play. Even the oppressed of the world have some of the most beautiful and amazing songs because it allows them to carry on in the midst. It allows them to be one people in the midst. And for whatever reason, our culture has come to praise the perfect and let go of the good. Now we're intimidated to sing because... You're, you know, you sing in all the keys, like me, right? You're not really sure what a key is. I still am not really sure what a key is. You have improved immensely over the years. But how many times have you said to yourself, oh, I can't sing. I'm not a singer. I don't have that gift to give. As if the gift was how perfect the song is. What if the gift is the freedom? What if the gift is the invitation? What if the gift is aliveness? I just think about how smiles are put on people's faces when they're around singing, when they're around song, when they're around that energy, especially somebody who's doing it because they love it, right? It's almost awkward when somebody really wants to share something with you. But when they share a recording of it, it's different when the, than when they sing it. When you join in, when it becomes part of you, part of us. I think excellence and this drive for excellence is really another way that anxiety manifests itself in our culture. And it also disconnects us from an embodiment. Because listening to music does have impacts on your brain. It does help with calmness. But they found that your cortisol levels drop when you sing your cortisol levels aren't impacted quite in the same way when you listen to music as when you sing, when you make music, and especially when you do it together. Suffice it to say, being in worship is part of staying connected to God in a particular way because we get to sing together multiple times while we're here. And so even if you're not very good, even if you really don't like your own singing voice, that's what we do here together. We become one voice together because it's the experience of singing, not the product of our singing, that matters in this place. A mind rooted in God is able to spread its branches.
Gratitude is what helps us expand our perception, helps us to see a bigger world. I'd argue that gratitude is the logical posture of becoming aware of reality. Because just think about how amazing it is. I mean, like, really think about it. Really look around the world and just notice how absolutely, fundamentally incredible everything really is. And it right-sizes things. Just being aware of how beautiful the world is, the sun shining and the leaves falling and the sounds of your feet walking on the path, it's incredible, it's overwhelming. There's even literally a condition, uh, I think it's in French because that's where sexy words are, um, that's literally just the description of being overwhelmed by beauty. Does anyone remember what this word is? No? Okay, I encourage you to look it up. The French had to literally make a word to talk about being overwhelmed by beauty because it was an experience that was something they were seeking in the culture. To encounter and to be awed. I think awe is probably the closest word we have in English, but it's a little bit more nuanced in the French. You know, uh, the psalmist says, uh, I'll just read that specifically. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Does God have to exalt? Does God have to put God's glory above all the earth? No. It's already there. It's always been there. God is exalted when we exalt God. God does not get exalted. God does not exalt God's self. God is exalted when we exalt God. And the only way we can do that is if we can root and ground, if we can become centered, so that we can be part of participating in that growthful energy in the world. We have an eternal anchor that is constantly offering us a steady presence in the midst of these violent storms. I'd like to close with uh, Philippians 4, and I'm going to read 4 through 8. Receive these words as a blessing unto you. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think on these things.